Part three of the Diary of a Superfluous Man. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Diary of a Superfluous Man by Ivan Turgenev. Translated by Constance Garnet. Part three. March twenty fifth. A white winter day. I have read over what I wrote yesterday and was all but tearing up the whole manuscript. I think my story's too spun out and too sentimental. However, as the rest of my recollections of that time presents nothing of a pleasurable character, except that peculiar sort of consolation which Lermontov had in view, when he said there is pleasure and pain in irritating the sores of old wounds, why not indulge oneself? but one must know where to draw the line, and so I will continue without any sort of sentimentality. During the whole of the week after the country excursion, my position was in reality in no way improved, though the change in Lisa became more noticeable every day. I interpreted this change, as I have said before, in the most favourable way for me. The misfortune of solitary and timid people, who are timid from self-consciousness, is just that, though they have eyes and indeed open them wide, they see nothing, or see everything in a false light, as though through coloured spectacles. Their own ideas and speculations trip them up at every step. At the commencement of our acquaintance, Lisa behaved confidingly and freely with me, like a child. Perhaps there may even have been in her attitude to me something more than mere childish liking, but after this strange, almost instantaneous change had taken place in her, after a period of brief perplexity, she felt constrained in my presence. She unconsciously turned away from me, and was at the same time melancholy and dreamy. She was waiting. For what? She did not know, while I, I, as I have said above, was delighted at this change. Yes, by God, I was ready to expire, as they say, with rapture. Though I am prepared to allow that anyone else in my place might have been deceived. Who is free from vanity? I need not say that all this was only clear to me in the course of time, when I had to lower my clipped and at no time over-powerful wings. The misunderstanding that had arisen between Lisa and me lasted a whole week, and there is nothing surprising in that. It has been my lot to be a witness of misunderstandings that have lasted for years and years. Who was it said, by the way, that truth alone is powerful? Falsehood is just as living as truth, if not more so. To be sure, I recollect that even during that week I felt from time to time an uneasy gnawing a stir within me. But solitary people like me, I say again, are as incapable of understanding what is going on within them as what is taking place before their eyes. And besides, is love a natural feeling? Is it natural for man to love? Love is a sickness, and for sickness there is no law. Granting that there was at times an unpleasant pang in my heart, well, everything inside me was turned upside down. And how is one to know in such circumstances what is all right and what is all wrong, and what is the cause and what the significance of each separate symptom? But be that as it may, all these misconceptions, presentiments and hopes were shattered in the following manner. One day, it was in the morning about twelve o'clock, I had hardly entered Mr. Ozhogin's hall when I heard an unfamiliar, mellow voice in the drawing-room. The door opened, and a tall and slim man of five-and-twenty appeared in the doorway, escorted by the master of the house. He rapidly put on a military overcoat which lay on the slab, and took cordial leave of Kirilla Matveitch. As he brushed past me, he carelessly touched his foraging cap, and vanished with a clink of his spurs. "'Who is that?' I asked Ozhogin. 
Prince N., the latter responded with a preoccupied face, sent from Petersburg to collect recruits. But where are the servants? He went on in a tone of annoyance. No one handed him his coat. We went into the drawing-room. Has he been here long? I inquired. Arrived yesterday evening, I'm told. I offered him a room here, but he refused. He seems a very nice fellow, though. Has he been long with you? About an hour. He asked me to introduce him to Olympiada Nikitishna. And did you introduce him? Of course. And Lizaveta Kirillovna, too, did he? He made her acquaintance, too, of course. I was silent for a space. Has he come here for long, do you know? Yes, I believe he has to be here for a fortnight. And Kirilla Matveitch hurried away to dress. I walked several times up and down the drawing-room. I don't recollect that Prince N.'s arrival made any special impression on me at the time, except that feeling of hostility which usually possesses us on the appearance of any new person in our domestic circle. Possibly there was mingled with this feeling something, too, of the nature of envy, of a shy and obscure person from Moscow, towards a brilliant officer from Petersburg. The prince, I mused, is an upstart from the capital. He'll look down upon us. I had not seen him for more than an instant, but I had had time to perceive that he was good-looking, clever, and at his ease. After pacing the room for some time, I stopped at last before a looking-glass, pulled a comb out of my pocket, gave a picturesque carelessness to my hair, and, as sometimes happens, became suddenly absorbed in the contemplation of my own face. I remember my attention centred anxiously about my nose. The soft and undefined outlines of that feature afforded me no great satisfaction. When suddenly, in the dark depths of the sloping mirror, which reflected almost the whole room, the door opened, and the slender figure of Lisa appeared. I don't know why I did not stir, and kept the same expression on my face. Lisa craned her head forward, looked intently at me, and raising her eyebrows, biting her lips, and holding her breath, as any one does who is glad at not being noticed, she cautiously drew back, and stealthily drew the door to after her. The door creaked slightly. Lisa started and stood rooted to the spot. I still kept from stirring. She pulled the handle again and vanished. There was no possibility of doubt. The expression of Lisa's face at the sight of my figure, that expression in which nothing could be detected except a desire to get away again successfully, to escape a disagreeable interview, the quick flash of delight I had time to catch in her eyes when she fancied she really had managed to creep away unnoticed. It all spoke too clearly. That girl did not love me. For a long, long while I could not take my eyes off that motionless, dumb door, which was once more a patch of white in the looking-glass. I tried to smile at my own long face, dropped my head, went home again, and flung myself on the sofa. I felt extraordinarily heavy at heart, so much so that I could not cry. And besides, what was there to cry about? Is it possible? I repeated incessantly, lying as though I were murdered, on my back, with my hands folded on my breast. Is it possible? Don't you think that's rather good, that... Is it possible? March 26th when next day after long hesitation and with a low sinking at my heart i went into the ozhogins familiar drawing-room i was no longer the same man as they had known during the last three weeks all my old peculiarities which i had begun to get over under the influence of a new feeling reappeared and took possession of me like proprietors returning to their house People of my sort are usually guided not so much by positive facts as by their own impressions. 
I, who no longer ago than the day before had been dreaming of the raptures of love returned, was that day no less convinced of my unhappiness, and was absolutely despairing, though I was not myself able to find any rational ground for my despair. I could not as yet be jealous of Prince N., and whatever his qualities might be, his mere arrival was not sufficient to extinguish Liza's good will towards me at once. But stay, was there any good will on her part? I recalled the past. What of the walk in the wood? I asked myself. What of the expression of her face in the glass? But, I went on, the walk in the wood, I think, fie on me! My God, what a wretched creature I am! I said at last, out loud. Of such sort were the unphrased, incomplete thoughts that went round and round a thousand times over in a monotonous whirl in my head. I repeat, I went back to the Ozhogins the same hypersensitive, suspicious, constrained creature I had been from my childhood up. I found the whole family in the drawing-room. Bismyonkov was sitting there too, in a corner. Everyone seemed in high good humour. Ozhogin, in particular, positively beamed, and his first word was to tell me that Prince N. had spent the whole of the previous evening with them. Lisa gave me a tranquil greeting. "'Oh,' said I to myself, "'now I understand why you're in such spirits. "'I must own the prince's second visit puzzled me. "'I had not anticipated it. "'As a rule, fellows like me anticipate everything in the world, "'except what is bound to occur in the natural order of things. "'I sulked and put on the air of an injured but magnanimous person.' I tried to punish Lisa by showing my displeasure, from which one must conclude that I was not yet completely desperate after all. They do say that in some cases, when one is really loved, it's positively of use to torment the adored one, but in my position it was indescribably stupid. Lisa, in the most innocent way, paid no attention to me. No one but Madame Ozhogin observed my solemn taciturnity and she inquired anxiously after my health. I replied, of course, with a bitter smile, that I was thankful to say I was perfectly well. Ozhogin continued to expatiate on the subject of their visitor, but noticing that I responded reluctantly, he addressed himself principally to Bismyonkov, who was listening to him with great attention, when a servant suddenly came in, announcing the arrival of Prince N., our host jumped up and ran to meet him. Lisa, upon whom I at once turned an eagle eye, flushed with delight, and made as though she would move from her seat. The prince came in, all agreeable perfume, gaiety, cordiality. As I am not composing a romance for a gentle reader, but simply writing for my own amusement, it stands to reason I need not make use of the usual dodges of our respected authors. I will say straight out, without further delay, that Lisa fell passionately in love with the prince from the first day she saw him, and the prince fell in love with her too, partly from having nothing to do, and partly from a propensity for turning women's heads and also owing to the fact that Lisa really was a very charming creature. There was nothing to be wondered at in their falling in love with each other. He had certainly never expected to find such a pearl in such a wretched shell. I am alluding to the God-forsaken town of O. And she had never in her wildest dreams seen anything in the least like this brilliant, clever, fascinating aristocrat. After the first courtesies, Ozhogin introduced me to the prince, who was very affable in his behaviour to me. He was, as a rule, very affable with everyone, and in spite of the immeasurable distance between him and our obscure provincial circle, he was clever enough to avoid being a source of constraint to anyone, and even to make a show of being on our level, and only living at Petersburg, as it were, by accident. That first evening, oh, that first evening, 
In our happy days of childhood, our teachers used to describe and set up before us, as an example, the manly fortitude of the young Spartan, who, having stolen a fox and hidden it under his tunic, without uttering one shriek, let it devour all his entrails, and so preferred death itself to disgrace. I can find no better comparison for my indescribable sufferings during the evening on which I first saw the prince by Lisa's side. My continual forced smile and painful vigilance, my idiotic silence, my miserable and ineffectual desire to get away, all that was doubtless something truly remarkable in its own way. It was not one wild beast alone gnawing at my vitals, Jealousy, envy, the sense of my own insignificance, and helpless hatred were torturing me. I could not but admit that the prince really was a very agreeable young man. I devoured him with my eyes. I really believe I forgot to blink, as usual, as I stared at him. He talked not to Lisa alone, but all he said was, of course, really for her. He must have felt me a great bore. He most likely guessed directly that it was a discarded lover he had to deal with, but from sympathy for me, and also a profound sense of my absolute harmlessness, he treated me with extraordinary gentleness. You can fancy how this wounded me. In the course of the evening I tried, I remember, to smooth over my mistake. I positively don't laugh at me, whoever you may be who chance to look through these lines especially as it was my last illusion, I positively, in the midst of my different sufferings, imagined all of a sudden that Lisa wanted to punish me for my haughty coldness at the beginning of my visit, that she was angry with me and only flirting with the prince from pique. I seized my opportunity, and with a meek but gracious smile, I went up to her and muttered, "'Enough, forgive me, not that I'm afraid.' and suddenly, without awaiting her reply, I gave my features an extraordinarily cheerful and free and easy expression, with a set grin, passed my hand above my head in the direction of the ceiling. I wanted, I remember, to set my cravat straight, and was even on the point of pirouetting round on one foot, as though to say, "'All is over. I am happy. Let's all be happy.' I did not, however, execute this manoeuvre as I was afraid of losing my balance, owing to an unnatural stiffness in my knees. Lisa failed absolutely to understand me. She looked in my face with amazement, gave a hasty smile as though she wanted to get rid of me as quickly as possible, and again approached the prince. Blind and deaf as I was, I could not but be inwardly aware that she was not in the least angry and was not annoyed with me at that instant. She simply never gave me a thought. The blow was a final one. My last hopes were shattered with a crash, just as a block of ice, thawed by the sunshine of spring, suddenly falls into tiny morsels. I was utterly defeated at the first skirmish, and like the Prussians at Jena, lost everything at once in one day. No, she was not angry with me. Alas, it was quite the contrary. She too, I saw that, was being swept off her feet by the torrent. Like a young tree, already half torn from the bank, she bent eagerly over the stream, ready to abandon to it forever the first blossom of her spring and her whole life. A man whose fate it has been to be the witness of such a passion has lived through bitter moments if he has loved himself and not been loved. I shall for ever remember that devouring attention, that tender gaiety, that innocent self-oblivion, that glance, still a child's and already a woman's, that happy, as it were, flowering smile that never left the half-parted lips and glowing cheeks. All that Lisa had vaguely foreshadowed during our walk in the wood had come to pass now, and she, as she gave herself up utterly to love, was at once stiller and brighter, like new wine, 
which ceases to ferment because its full maturity has come. I had the fortitude to sit through that first evening and the subsequent evenings, all to the end. I could have no hope of anything. Lisa and the prince became every day more devoted to each other. But I had absolutely lost all sense of personal dignity, and could not tear myself away from the spectacle of my own misery. I remember one day I tried not to go, swore to myself in the morning that I would stay at home, and at eight o'clock in the evening, I usually set off at seven, leapt up like a madman, put on my hat, and ran breathless into Kirilla Matveitch's drawing-room. My position was excessively absurd. I was obstinately silent. Sometimes for whole days together I did not utter a sound. I was, as I have said already, never distinguished for eloquence. But now everything I had in my mind took flight, as it were, in the presence of the prince, and I was left bare and bereft. Besides, when I was alone, I set my wretched brain working so hard, slowly going over everything I had noticed or surmised during the preceding day, that when I went back to the Ozhogins, I scarcely had energy left to observe again. They treated me considerately, as a sick person. I saw that. Every morning I adopted some new, final resolution for the most part painfully hatched in the course of a sleepless night. At one time I made up my mind to have it out with Lisa, to give her friendly advice. But when I chanced to be alone with her, my tongue suddenly ceased to work, froze, as it were, and we both, in great discomfort, waited for the entrance of some third person. Another time I meant to run away, of course for ever, leaving my beloved a letter full of reproaches. And I even one day began this letter. But the sense of justice had not yet quite vanished in me. I realized that I had no right to reproach anyone for anything, and I flung what I had written in the fire. Then I suddenly offered myself up wholly as a sacrifice, gave Lisa my benediction, praying for her happiness, and smiled in meek and friendly fashion from my corner at the prince. But the cruel-hearted lovers not only never thanked me for my self-sacrifice, they never even noticed me, and were apparently quite ready to dispense with my smiles and my blessings. Then in wrath I suddenly flew into quite the opposite mood. I swore to myself, wrapping my cloak about me like a Spaniard, to rush out from some dark corner and stab my lucky rival, and with brutal glee I imagined Lisa's despair. But in the first place such corners were few in the town of O, and secondly the wooden fence, the street lamp, the policeman in the distance. No, in such corners it was somehow far more suitable to sell buns and oranges than to shed human blood. I must own that, among other means of deliverance, as I very vaguely expressed it in my colloquies with myself, I did entertain the idea of having recourse to Ozhogin himself, of calling the attention of that nobleman to the perilous situation of his daughter, and the mournful consequences of her indiscretion. I even once began speaking to him on a certain delicate subject, but my remarks were so indirect and misty, that after listening and listening to me, he suddenly, as it were, waking up, rubbed his hand rapidly and vigorously all over his face, not sparing his nose, gave a snort, and walked away from me. It is needless to say that in resolving on this step, I persuaded myself that I was acting from the most disinterested motives, was desirous of the general welfare, and was doing my duty as a friend of the house. But I venture to think that even had Kirilla Matveitch not cut short my outpourings, I should in any case not have had courage to finish my monologue. At times I set to work with all the solemnity of some sage of antiquity, weighing the qualities of the prince. At times I comforted myself with the hope that it was all of no consequence, that Lisa would recover her senses, that her love was not real love. Oh, no! 
In short, I know no idea that I did not worry myself with at that time. There was only one resource which never, I candidly admit, entered my head. I never once thought of taking my life. Why it did not occur to me, I don't know. Possibly, even then, I had a presentiment I should not have long to live in any case. It will be readily understood that in such unfavourable circumstances my manner, my behaviour with people, was more than ever marked by unnaturalness and constraint. Even Madame Ozhogin, that creature dull-witted from her birth up, began to shun me, and at times did not know in what way to approach me. Vizmyonkov, always polite and ready to do services, avoided me. I fancied even at that time that I had in him a companion in misfortune, that he too loved Lisa, but he never responded to my hints, and altogether showed a reluctance to converse with me. The prince behaved in a very friendly way to him. The prince, one might say, respected him. Neither Bismyonkov nor I was any obstacle to the prince and Lisa, but he did not shun them as I did, nor look savage nor injured and readily joined them when they desired it. It is true that on such occasions he was not conspicuous for any special mirthfulness, but his good humour had always been somewhat subdued in character. In this fashion about a fortnight passed by. The prince was not only handsome and clever, he played the piano, sang, sketched fairly well, and was a good hand at telling stories. His anecdotes, drawn from the highest circles of Petersburg society, always made a great impression on his audience, all the more so from the fact that he seemed to attach no importance to them. The consequence of this, if you like, simple accomplishment of the prince's was that in the course of his not very protracted stay in the town of O, he completely fascinated all the neighbourhood. To fascinate us poor dwellers in the steppes is at all times a very easy task for anyone coming from higher spheres. The prince's frequent visits to the Ozhogins, he used to spend his evenings there, of course aroused the jealousy of the other worthy gentry and officials of the town. But the prince, like a clever person and a man of the world, never neglected a single one of them. He called on all of them. To every married lady and every unmarried miss, he addressed at least one flattering phrase, allowed them to feed him on elaborately solid edibles, and to make him drink wretched wines with magnificent names, and conducted himself, in short, like a model of caution and tact. Prince N. was in general a man of lively manners, sociable and genial by inclination and in this case, incidentally, from prudential motives also, he could not fail to be a complete success in everything. Ever since his arrival, all in the house had felt that the time had flown by with unusual rapidity. Everything had gone off beautifully. Papa Ozhogin, though he pretended that he had noticed nothing, was doubtless rubbing his hands in private at the idea of such a son-in-law. The prince, for his part, managed matters with the utmost sobriety and discretion, when all of a sudden an unexpected incident. Oh, till tomorrow. Today I'm tired. These recollections irritate me, even at the edge of the grave. Terentyevna noticed today that my nose has already begun to grow sharp, and that, they say, is a bad sign. End of part three. Recording by Martin Geeson in Hazelmere, Surrey.